Hello and welcome back. We still have one very interesting item on our agenda for you. I would like to introduce our distinguished guest, Ms. Sophie Serpent, the CEO of Consultative Group to assist the poor house at the World Bank. Sophie, the virtual floor is yours. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at the Social Finance Vibe 2022. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I really look forward to speaking to you about how we can more intentionally contribute to building a resilient future for all through all the very impactful, very important work you all do. But before I begin, um, a quick word about CGAP for those of you who do not know us. We are a global partnership that operates like a think and do tank. We host the World Bank. Um, our objective is to advance the lives of the poor, especially women through financial inclusion. And we do that through action-oriented research to test, learn, and share knowledge intended to help build inclusive and responsible financial systems for the poor and other vulnerable groups. Now, turning to um, how we can all build a resilient future through our work, this is extremely important because over the last few years, our world economies and markets have been enduring multiple crises with increased frequency and intensity, whether it's the pandemic and other health shocks, record inflation, surging energy prices, or political unrest in many parts of the world. These crises have obviously affected nearly everyone on the planet, but their impact on the poor is more pronounced and they have already left millions of people in a more vulnerable state. The COVID-19 pandemic alone has caused unprecedented reversals in poverty reduction, and that has been further exacerbated by rising inflation, obviously, and the effects of the war in Ukraine. The World Bank estimates that these combined crises will lead to an additional 75 to 95 million people living in extreme poverty in 2022 compared to pre-pandemic projections. And for the first time in a long time, food insecurity has re-emerged as a threat in 2022. Now, this problem is exacerbated by the fact that the crises have really affected government's finances and record high debt levels are now constraining countries' ability to respond to these challenges. The UN, for instance, has identified that 54 developing economies have severe debt problems, which are home to 50% of people living in extreme poverty. And some countries are now spending more on debt interest payments than on health, education, and social protection combined. And this is not the end of the story because indeed, while poor people in developing countries contribute relatively little to carbon emissions, they are also suffering disproportionately from the impact of climate change compared to people in wealthy economies. Climate change could indeed push up to 100 and 32 million people into extreme poverty by 2030, according to the World Bank. And climate change will affect women and girls much more than men and boys. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change finds indeed that women make up 80% of people forcibly displaced by climate-related disasters in developing economies, and women and girls also experience larger second and third order effects to climate change, including increased risk of gender-based violence, dropping out of school, or early child marriage. So in view of all these shocks and setbacks, the recently released six annual goalkeepers report by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation found that the world will achieve nearly none of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, by 2030, based on the current trajectory and actions including eliminating poverty, hunger, and gender inequality. Fundamentally, with poor people constantly buffeted by laws that threatens to erode any gains they have made and throw their lives into disarray, progress out of poverty has just become increasingly fragile. For this reason, it's just fundamental, vital for any development agenda, including for financial inclusion, that we consider how poor and vulnerable households can build resilience and adapt to the crisis impacting their lives. 
If we don't do this, we simply risk failing at our original mission to help the poor improve their well-being. So resilience is fundamental to development. And so what is the role of financial services and of financial inclusion in bolstering resilience? How can we all contribute in this room? Well, CGAP has evidence that inclusive finance can actually play an absolutely critical role in building the resilience of the poor and help them prepare for, cope with, and adapt to um, the various shocks that affect their lives. Different products play in different roles for different shocks. While the role of financial services in promoting growth and poverty reduction is still debated and empirically unresolved, the evidence um, is robust, um, showing that they can help prevent people from falling deeper into poverty. For example, reliable savings and remittance products can help smooth consumption during periods of crisis. Credit products can help the poor invest in risk reduction measures or transition into new livelihoods and diversify their sources of income. And of course, insurance helps poor people handle losses and rebuild their lives and livelihoods. This can happen even informally, as was seen, for instance, following the damaging floods in Mozambique in early 2013, when it's actually mobile phones linked to money accounts that served as informal insurance networks among the poor. So fundamentally, financial services can really play a key role in building the resilience of the poor to many shocks and crises, but to fully leverage their potential as tools to building resilience, we still have a long way to go. You probably know, all know the global FINDEX um, uh, database, which is the preeminent worldwide measurement source of financial inclusion. Well, FINDEX illustrates that even though there has been a sharp increase in the number of people with access to an account, as well as in the number of people using accounts, this has not yet led to meaningful impact in terms of resiliency. We see indeed from the data that in developing economies, only 55% of adults could access emergency money in 30 days with little or no difficulty. And for the poorest 40% of household, household, only 40% could do that. And that compares with 79% for high income economies. So really the resiliency of the poor is still at risk. It is probably unsurprising then that CGAP's new strategy will be focused on ensuring financial services contribute to sustainable development for the poor. We see sustainable development as comprising three main components, green, resilient, and inclusive development, with inclusive finance as a key pathway to achieving these. Here are some of the highlights you can anticipate seeing in our new strategy. From a green perspective, we will be focusing on supporting mitigation, adaptation, and transition of the pool through financial services. From a resilience perspective, we will be focusing on supporting greater resilience of the pool through financial services, as well as on fostering inclusive finance in countries facing fragility, conflict, and violence. And from an inclusion perspective, we'll be focusing on fostering women's empowerment, as well as productivity and growth of micro, small, and medium enterprises through digital financial inclusion. Our strategy will also put a clear emphasis on building responsible financial ecosystems and ensuring consumers' financial health. This is because we recognize, of course, that we can only achieve positive outcomes for the poor if we identify and address any possible risk and unintended consequences that could stand in the way of the collective impact of inclusive finance going forward. Now, this is all part of the equation, but you all have vital roles to play as financial inclusion actors and socially minded investors and professional. There is no time to waste on greenwashing and social washing. Responsible action must be taken now and at scale for a sustainable future. You know, the public sector finances are heavily constrained in the coming years, um, will be heavily constrained in the coming years. And finding ways to maximize the role of the private sector in driving this broader agenda will be essential. Government will still have a role to play, obviously. They will need to provide the basic enabling environment required for the private sector to flourish, such as stability, policy, regulation, and supervision, and of course, infrastructure. 
but we believe that the role of the private sector will be paramount. The private sector can drive up the scale and impact of their social investment and focus more specifically, more intentionally on building resilience among the poor. As we set out to achieve all this and contribute to sustainable development, we need to go beyond measuring account access and usage of financial services. Both these measures are only meaningful if they are providing utility, that is, if they are providing practical benefits and positive outcomes for the poor and their communities, such as creating new income opportunities for individuals and strengthening society's resilience. Now is the time for you to be ambitious in setting your goals. To conclude, the world today is rattled with unprecedented shocks. But if we leave behind the world's unbanked and underbanked, who are among the most vulnerable to crises that they did not cause, then all our efforts to create a greener, more resilient, and more inclusive world will have failed. However, if we collectively use our resources and ingenuity, we can take positive steps towards addressing chronic social needs while confronting the world's most urgent crisis. Responsible, sustainable, and inclusive financial services are one important tool that contributes to far-reaching global goals. We have our agenda set up for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, for your inspirational remarks and your call to action to all of us to cooperate and act now and at scale. As Sophie mentioned, uh, today we need not only public stakeholders, but uh, most of all private actors to drive the green, resilient and inclusive agenda forward. Let's make sure the inclusivity pathway is at the center of this drive, so we leave nobody behind, especially those that are unbanked, the underbanked, the vulnerable. Two days of learning together are coming to an end. Let me thank again our strategic sponsor, the European Commission, as well as other partners. Big applause to almost 50 moderators and speakers and to all of you attending, asking questions, commenting. Thank you for co-creating this event with us. For the conference summary and formal closing, I would like to invite Mr. Archil Bakuradze, MFC Council Member. Archil, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh... The participants uh, of Social Finance Wipe 2022, and it is my great pleasure to present to you the highlights of this event, uh, which in fact hosted almost 500 participants from 75 countries. So in terms of main highlights, uh, first of all, we welcomed the launch of the Social Economy Action Plan. And the next EU, EU Council recommendation for the member states presents the opportunity to, first of all, make the work of the social actors more visible within the mainstream world of finance. And the second is that it offers to establish cooperation with the state actors within the member states. There's a need to build an ecosystem uh, for social finance. The way uh, is through building the cooperation between various partners. In countries with strong tradition of cooperation between state and private actors, including, including industry associations, the, the sector of social economy finance is stronger and more visible. This requires from us the trust and courage to go out from our bubbles and talk to stakeholders who until now have not been our natural allies. There is a need for knowing who is who and who is doing what in social economy sector. This conference clearly put microfinance in the social economy domain. It is clear that MFI with a social mission is also a social enterprise. Microfinance sector is serving 414,000 entrepreneurs and low-income people. Many of them are missing entrepreneurs as defined by OECD and EU, which obviously positions us as social economy actors. We think that Public administrations should take leading role in offering financial instruments connecting to social economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, that normally has only limited access to funding, usually. Tradi traditional investors would otherwise not have been able to finance 
this sector because of the perceived high risk level. So it's obviously a matter of cooperation once again. Financial instruments are expected to generate leverage effects so that additional resources, both public and private, are attracted to social economy. There are various EU programs and initiatives which gives opportunity to access financing and capacity building services to microfinance and social enterprise finance uh, actors. Our event gave a snapshot of invest EU resources. Uh, we looked on updates of social inclusive finance technical assistance program and uh, highlight uh, use of various instruments in the area of integration of migrants. As far as mega trends are concerned, be alarmed. Uh, in crisis, all stakeholders take coordinated action, as we know. And this approach was successful during pandemic. And we should continue this cooperation, thinking in systemic ways about influencing other stakeholders. We saw encouraging examples of MFIs adapting their business models in unpredictable environment to serve the vulnerable people and uh, those in need, such as refugees, displaced entrepreneurs and minorities. Refugees can contribute to host communities and cooperation of various stakeholders, public or private, can lead to more inclusive environment in this context. Couple of highlights on green uh, economy. As you know, there are tools to support green transition at various stages. Tools to improve awareness, uh, and going through the process from strategies through setting goals and implementation. There are institutions taking, which take extra mile to experiment and being proactive in this area. It is important to underline inclusion dimension within green transition, that nobody is left behind, as everybody are competing for green funds. And final uh, set of comments about digitalization. Uh, the cost of technology is the main barrier to digital transformation by MFIs. 51% of MFIs claim this is a challenge. And there are initiatives that are trying to tackle this challenge, but, they are not, but these are not enough. Uh, few investors support MFIs, but we need more of them to help MFIs to go through this process. On top of financing, MFIs need to be supported in digitalization by raising awareness on its benefits, and but also being supported in developing and implementing these digitalization strategies. Another barrier to digitalization is digital skills of clients who need their skills being uplifted. There's a need for comprehensive approach of building clients' capacity in digitalization. MFC together with some members and partners has been working in this direction for a long time, but there are still long way to go. So finally, I'm privileged also as part of my concluding remarks to announce uh, about the venue of the next MFC annual conference. So the next MFC annual conference 2023 will be organized in wonderful Montenegro. So book your calendar soon for the second half of May and look forward to meeting you at the MFC annual conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Archie, thank you so much for excellent conference summary and for revealing the location of 2023 uh, um, MFC annual conference, which is Montenegro. This uh, event would not have been possible without the commitment, strong engagement, and very hard work of the MFC team. I would like to thank all of the team members here in the MFC Warsaw office, as well as um, members working with us remotely from Slovakia and uh, Brussels uh, in Belgium. Uh, and I would also like to, to give my personal thanks. Uh, Carol, don't uh, escape. Uh, first of all, to Carol Pichniewski, our uh, coordinator who has uh, driven us through the meanders of this very challenging journey and uh, we came here to this great event uh, today to be able to meet and learn together with you. Um, second, Eva Bankowska for her leadership and oversight of the whole event, uh, supporting the whole team with both content and the technical aspects of the event preparation. Uh, 
uh, Alexander Karabon and uh, Joanna uh, Lukowska, as well as Marcin Savitsky, who is already on his way to Italy for excellent technical support, helping uh, all of you to solve your technical problems at the help desk, uh, cloning themselves to be at the same time at hopping at Zoom to really take an extra mile and make sure that you can join us and participate in this event, co-create the sessions with us, share your experience and take the lessons learned uh, with you. And Agnieszka Lubowiecka, our uh, marketing manager for the promotion, communication and marketing of the event, uh, did applause to her. Thanks to her, we were able to reach to over 500 uh, participants participating in this event, informing you uh, regularly on how the preparations are going and uh, how the agenda is being developed and the um, actual implementation of this event over these two days. Uh, last, not, last but not least, I would also like to mention Justyna Pytkowska, who is uh, with us uh, on the screen, who actually helped develop the agenda. She was uh, uh, driving um, the design and co-creation of the agenda with our uh, partner organization through an action group dedicated to this event, uh, meeting regularly, collecting uh, ideas about uh, interesting cases, lessons learned, mega trends, innovation, and uh, thanks to this uh, result with input of other members of the team, we have uh, had such a great event uh, to, today, so diverse and, uh, and rich uh, in content. I would like also to thank um, Pavel, who is also joining us uh, online from Slovakia for um, preparing and moderating the sessions. Kasia Hanula Hobbit, Nina Josefina Bonk, uh, Eva Bańkowska again, uh, as well as um, Grzegorz Galusek, who uh, contributed to the preparation of the sessions, uh, contributed with presentations as well as moderation of the agenda. Uh, we also can always support on our great uh, MFC Council members. I would like to thank very much our chairwoman, uh, Brunilda Isai, for opening remarks, um, Archie Bakuradze to so wonderfully uh, help us summarize the learnings of this conference and review the agenda, as well as Gabriele Duletti for helping us to moderate the sessions on uh, with the awardees of our Green Financial Inclusive award uh, thanks to all of you all the partners again the whole team uh, sponsors members co-creators we are extremely uh, happy to have you among us in our community and be able to organize such events uh, to the benefit of uh, the mfc um, and the, the larger sector we hope uh, to see you all next year at our on-site uh, conference uh, as we uh, heard from Archie, there will be an exciting place uh, which is already awaiting for us in Montenegro where we can have physical meetings and continue our learning uh, together. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, learning event and have had a memorable virtual experience. As we rely so much on your feedback, I would like to encourage you to fill in the conference evaluation form available via the link you can see in the chat box. We hope to see you all next year face to face in Montenegro. Thank you and see you for 2023 in Montenegro. Thanks.